Well, it looks like we have a, a slowing number of participants joining. That's up to 64. So I will um, jump right in and begin this session. Uh, my name is Reed Sturdivant. I'm one of the general partners at the engine. Uh, what I'd like to do is first thank you for joining and uh, being interested in this topic and in hearing what the engine does and how we work with um, technology transfer uh, out of MIT and other universities. Uh, what I'd like to do today is um, describe what the engine is and what our mission is, the three pillars of our system, if you will, uh, specifically more information about um, how we make investment decisions, and then by example, take you through a number of uh, slides around companies that we've worked with that have come out of MIT, out of the MIT environment. Always happy to answer questions. Um, probably don't have a full 90 minutes of, of content. Uh, so at the very end, I'm absolutely open to having a conversation about um, deeper about the engine or more generally about how venture works as a, as a system and a, as a business. Um, so let me just jump right in. Um, so the engine invests in early stage companies that are working on problems that are important to the world. So President Raphael Reif a number of years ago took the time to say, look, there's friction in the path of the commercialization of science and engineering based uh, breakthroughs um, in a number of places. Should MIT take responsibility for running an experiment uh, in a, essentially a form of a market intervention. So MIT put the engine into business uh, and we're really working on three main things. One is a venture capital, set of venture capital funds. The second is specialized co-working infrastructure. And the third is building momentum around the ecosystem and a, rel a relationship, a network of relationships. The general opportunity was that in the Boston area, anchored by MIT and other surrounding research institutions, there are many, many um, principal investigators, labs, and uh, innovation that's happening all the time across an entire range of types of uh, technical areas, ranging from energy to manufacturing, biotech. Uh, we um, uh, are taking an effort at the engine to try to push these into uh, scale and success in terms of positive impact on the world. Uh, we're uh, just almost exactly five years old. We have, uh, as in terms of a snapshot of where we stand, we have uh, made investments and commitments to 37 companies. Uh, there's a 38 that's just about to close. Those companies uh, have already grown to the point where they employ hundreds of people locally. And apart from the investment from the engine, they've collectively raised uh, almost uh, just over $3 billion of capital uh, in the last five years. So there's momentum and there's growth. Uh, we're very happy with how it's going. We, at the engine, we're just one of many venture firms in the area and in the world. Uh, most of them are specialized around one type of, of investment area. We're very diverse. We work across many, many types of, of companies and um, working on solving many type problems in the world. We're not, um, although we're not organized as a thematic um, set of theses, we, for instance, we haven't taken the 17 UN uh, SDG sustainable development goals. We have to invest in each of those areas at, at a certain levels of, of uh, the stack, so if you will. Um, we're very opportunistic, um, but we have, um, in hindsight, we really work it across three broad areas. Uh, first is climate change. This of course involves energy, production, transmission, storage, uh, re and also resource efficiency. So in this area, we, we look for things that are um, reducing the use of energy in manufacturing, uh, reducing the release of carbon uh, in different types of materials and manufacturing processes. This is about 40% of the, um, uh, the work we do fits into this general area. Second category we think of as human health and wellness. 
this uh, is not traditional pharmaceutical or therapies that, that you might see across Kendall Square, but many things that are convergence of different types of technologies, uh, advanced manufacturing for cell therapies, um, different types of delivery techniques for drugs and vaccines. And uh, we also look for things in food and ag. So that's health and wellness in a general, general sense. And then the last category is a set of companies that are working on infrastructure and advanced systems that really are platforms that will improve and support many different sectors. The, um, uh, this is the category where we would put semiconductor companies. We've invested in photonics, gallium nitride processes, uh, AI accelerators. We would also put things that are um, uh, uh, different types of materials. Um, and we would also put things that are uh, a systems level, if you will, transportation and mobility would fit into this category. So let me switch gears a little bit and talk about um, what we look for when we get involved with uh, supporting a company. And very, very strongly, we feel that we're, we're looking to support ambitious founders. So we, we definitely are not specialists in deep in these technologies. So we're really looking for people who have committed themselves uh, to make the world a better place by commercializing a solution to a big problem. Where these founders, uh, we love it when they, they uh, wanna make an impact on the world and realize that global commercial success, commercial success at a global scale is a mechanism to have the broadest possible impact. Um, so as the three parts that I talked about at the engine were a venture firm, we have, uh, as I mentioned, perhaps $600 million under management in, in a variety of funds so far. Um, over the last five years, we really have focused at um, trying to understand the founding team's potential. It's fine if they're technical founders and technical leaders. It's fine if this is the first company they, they've done. Um, we, we really need to believe that they can grow in their leadership capabilities and could build a very, very large company. So that's the second thing we look at is um, how big a business could this be? If you've looked at the venture industry, if we're writing checks at the very earliest stages of a company's existence, but we don't make money for our investors until very late in the company's growth. So we have to believe that the little piece of equity that we'll have at the end um, is part of an enormous business. So we're, we're fine if it takes a long time. Our fund is structured with, with much longer than normal fund life, um, up to 18 years for most US funds can go up to 10 years. Uh, we're fine with, with a lot of technical risks. We're less, we're, we're less able to take market risk. Um, but if you look at a company like Commonwealth Fusion, working on commercial fusion power, there is a market and demand for cheap electricity. Um, there is a lot of technical risk um, to building the machines, if you will, that will supply that and the cost of the electricity that you can get from that. But there's very little market risk in, in power generation. And lastly, we look for things that, where the, the business is built on some fundamental technical breakthrough. So we wouldn't, the engine is not a place to come if, if a company is, has a business model disruption and that's their, their approach to, to a commercialization. We really look for things that at the heart are based on some technical breakthrough, uh, most often out of research, uh, but sometimes out of industry and, and in, invention and engineering uh, uh, breakthroughs as well. We look back recently at the 37, 38 companies that we've said yes to so far from, the, from an investment point of view. And here's some, some interesting things that we've, we've found. Almost all of our investments are very early staged 
seed stage, pre-seed stage investments of the first check where it's less than $3 million. That's, that's, um, so we have a preference for um, um, helping companies at, at the earliest stage where there is this valley of death. And that was our mission from the start. It's like there's friction in the path of this entrepreneurial journey. Can we set up a firm like the engine to, to remove some of that friction? Most of the teams that we invest in are first time founders. Um, not 100%, but most of them are. Um, we, it's not unusual for the engine to invest in a team where there might be two full time founders and a professor as a co founder. Um, it's sometimes we meet them much later, and I'll show in some of the stories of the companies that we've, we've worked with that, that um, this is universal. Um, most of the, of the companies, as I mentioned, are seed stage, and most of the companies, when we first get involved, uh, are looking for less than uh, $3 million, not universally, but, but uh, about a quarter of them are looking at for uh, raising between three and $10 million. So that kind of wraps the summary of the venture fund as part of our business model. This picture is from um, our, when the engine launched. These were the first uh, few companies that we had invested in at that point. Uh, and you can see even like uh, companies like Via Separations, I'll mention them more, in more detail later. When we got to know them, they, they were that exact two full-time founders and a professor. They now are, are up and running, and we wrote them, I think, a check for less than $2 million, if I remember right. And now they've moved, uh, they've moved quite, a, quite a, further, uh, a further way. Um, thank you for the questions. I'll come back and, and pick some of those up in, in a few minutes. Um, the second piece of our work is really building a network of relationships. So we, in our own way, have a small set of corporate relationships that we pull together. We try to uh, try to convene around a variety of formats. So this is much easier, obviously, uh, pre-COVID. But we run every year. We run a business development day where we we match make and and arrange uh, meetings between not just engine companies, but local startups and tech companies and the, and the corporations we work with. We have developed and delivered uh, sort of mini symposium around uh, certain landscapes like clean tech and, and semiconductors. Uh, and we run a design thinking workshops we call uh, provocations. So for instance, around fusion power, we pull together about 40 uh, representatives from different stakeholders around um, the question, what if the technology becomes practical? That'll take some time, not as long as most people think, in my opinion. Um, if the te technical, if the technology around fusion power is no longer the long pole in the tent, what else needs to happen before then or, or in conjunction with that? So this, we had stakeholders ranging from policymakers, uh, technical technology companies, uh, consumers of, of electricity and power, um, even, even representatives from the Sierra Club. So one of the interesting things that came out of that day was um, the group created a new uh, industry foundation. So the Fusion Industry Association, was created to work on things like policy and, and consumer, um, uh, consumer perception uh, as well. Um, the other thing we do every year, we have, a, it's now a two day conference that in Boston that we uh, pull together people who are working to build companies and people who are working together to support companies with capital. So that's a very big, big part of what we do and it gets bigger every year. And lastly, for the network, um, we are, the engine is, is small, 37, 38 companies in five years is, is barely a, a dent in, in what, what needs to happen um, in our belief. So, so we do invest in creating momentum and storytelling uh, around encouraging people early in career or late in career to, to, to shift their attention to working on problems that, that really are 
important for the world long term. We try to pull more investment capital toward that uh, goal as well, whether it's venture, private equity, um, project capital, um, public sector. So we, we really work on trying to, 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 to put momentum into play around what we're loosely calling tough tech. Um, and one unusual thing about the engine is that we're a, we're a for-profit company. We're not a part of MIT. Um, we are structured as what's called a Delaware Public Benefit Corporation, which is a corporate structure that um, allows the board of directors of the engine to keep an eye on shareholder value, which is a fiduciary duty, but in addition, keep an eye on a mission. So every, every Delaware Public Benefit Corporation on a, on a two-year cycle has to publish information about that supports, how, are, you, are you actually supporting your mission? Uh, so uh, if you go to our website, we publish these every two years and it, it tries to break down, okay, well, how have our efforts really supported the mission uh, of, of, of the engine, which is independent of the financial success uh, of the firm. Um, the last third pillar uh, of what we do is infrastructure. And by that, I mean really shared access to capital equipment. And um, we have our uh, central square facility, 30,000 square feet. It has desks for rent. It has a small scale machine shop. It's got biology safety level two labs. It's got chemistry benches and fume hoods. It's got an electronics and prototyping facility. So it's, it, you can pay by the month for desks. You can pay as you go lab fees. And what it really does is if you're a young company moving out of your university lab and you raise a small amount of money, it, it means you don't have to take all of, uh, as much money and build out your own lab facilities right away. You can have access to shared equipment and, and, and shared space that's already outfitted for, for, for lab style work. It's, it's fun to walk around our lab versus other co-working space like, like um, uh, Greentown Labs or um, um, the, the bio labs uh, in Kendall Square because it's unusual to have a biosafety level two lab and a five axis milling machine. But the companies that we work with actually do need that, that uh, mixture uh, of equipment. Uh, we also have relationships with 22 other facilities around the area that have uh, um, corporate access policies. And we've tried to help them make it easy for them to work with really small companies. Uh, and that, that's an important part of what we've done. Uh, and lastly, we're about nine months away from opening uh, a new facility at 750 Main Street, kind of halfway between Central and Kendall Square, quite close to uh, MIT core campus and, and with room for not just 200 people, which our Central Square facility can handle, but up to 1,000 uh, people. And, and a little bit of a heavier um, uh, type of work can happen there. It's got a loading dock and you could run forklifts and do welding, which we can't do in our current facility. Um, we will also have, we'll, we look to use this for the commercial ecosystem, uh, industry, public sector, um, and academia. You know, we will we'll have a small conference center, could fit a couple hundred people, and we're going to try to use it as, as a center of activity for, for the types of companies that we, we help uh, work with each other. Opportunistically, we just took uh, at least 40,000 square feet of fabrication space, you might call it, uh, in Somerville on Tyler Street, and we're subletting that um, on a month-to-month -month basis, so that's available for, we've already had um, one piece of Commonwealth Fusion, a company that we work with, move into there. Um, so we're, we're opportunistically trying to keep um, the center of gravity of a lot of this work close to um, close together. Uh, yes, we have companies that move out to Woburn or Framingham uh, as they grow, but if we can keep things, uh, there's obviously value to geographic density. And so we're, we're trying to opportunistically um, run this. So those are the three, three parts of, of how the engine works with small companies. We're a venture capital firm. Uh, we are um, building a network and we are providing uh, 
shared infrastructure. So a sort of little bit of an unusual combination. In, in five years, we have had a lot of, of visitors who are trying to understand how our model works. You know, hey, we want to think of doing something like this in Singapore, or hey, you know, this university, uh, we're, we're starting to think about, should we try something? There, so far, I haven't run into anything that really matches this model. The, the fact that it has super strong support from MIT um, and now from Harvard. Harvard is an investor in our second venture fund as well. Um, but we're independent. Most that we've universities projects that we see are, are captive to that specific university or university system. Um, and the fact that not only do we write checks uh, and um, work with the companies hand you know hand side by side, but we also are running a co-working uh, set of infrastructure. That's a, that's an unusual combination. So. Uh, we're, and we're small, we're 25 people, um, full-time employees, probably half and half on the investment side and the infrastructure side. Um, more, more than half female. Uh, we're trying to keep an eye on um, uh, diversity as, as everybody does these days, um, but we're, we're still small, so we consider ourselves scrappy. Um, so before I move into the company, um, pieces. Let me answer a few questions uh, that have come through, and, and I invite more. Um, so I have a question from Andrew: Is can we get a copy of these slides? And yes, I can share a, a PDF with the um, the TLO organizers and uh, figure out how to have that sent out to anybody that would like a copy. Um, thank you for that question. Craig asks: How does how do we coordinate with MIT's TLO, with the E14 Fund, etc.? Um, and the it, it varies sort of a situationally. We don't have any um, any special contractual relationship uh, or access, if you will, with MIT's IP. Uh, we're we're investors in a financial sense, just as the, the uh, TLO is an investor in, the, in terms of investing MIT's IP appropriately. Um, we have regular meetings with licensing offices. We do, before we write a check to a company that comes out of MIT, we do make sure we understand that, yeah, they, they have had the right conversations with, with the TLO uh, as needed. Uh, we are, we regularly check in with different groups like the, um, uh, for issues like conflict of interest. Um, um, we do work closely with um, some teams like uh, MIT's ILP, the Industrial Liaison Program, uh, has been very, very helpful uh, in, in, in a bi-directional way where if our companies are trying to get access uh, to, to a conversation with a corporation that happens to be an ILP member, the, the uh, relationship managers have helped very much in, in, in setting up uh, calls uh, and vice versa. If there's an ILP member that, that has a specific interest in, in some area that we're working on like uh, green cement um, that we can, we can uh, uh, take a call and, and have arrange meetings uh, across our portfolio. Um, the E14 fund, other, other MIT related investment groups, um, we, we haven't invested, well, we had one legacy investment that we, we were co-investors with E14, um, but we haven't done new investments yet with them, but we, we talk to them regularly. Um, Yaniv asks, um, does the engine lead rounds? As a venture investor, we prefer to lead or co-lead. Uh, we do follow. Um, I can give some examples in the following slides of that. Um, almost all of the times we've invested as a lead, uh, it's been a, um, we've had co-investors. Um, other small funds, um, uh, some angel groups. Um, we, um, uh, the only times that we've said, you know what, why don't we write the whole first check have been when the, um, the founding team hasn't really made some critical decisions about where their first market will be or, or what business model they want to take. And, and we want to be very flexible and, and let the founder be very flexible about that. And we don't want too many voices to, to be 
you know, conflicting voices about those types of major decisions early on, um, but that's rare. Um, and then, uh, John, I'm not sure, uh, says if the project comes to our labs, what is the opportunity going forward? Um, not sure exactly what you mean by that, but um, the, if it's about the infrastructure, it's um, we either have a tenant who just we're not is not a portfolio company who rents space or lab space. Um, uh, if it's a portfolio company, they just pay the same fees as 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 a a, a tenant would. Um, but there's no expectation that if a tenant that we we don't have a investment relationship with rents lab space, there's no tie on their IP. Um, you know, it's, they're just a company who's working on whatever they're working on and, and um, the engine is a landlord um, in, in that case. Um, our VCs, Craig also asked, our VCs, the, the optimal model for funding tough tech, um, LP expectations with respect to ROI. Um, good question, very good question. Um, uh, the answer is venture is not always a good model for funding tough tech. Um, we've tried to set up the engine and we've, we have, uh, the investors in our funds um, understand our model in that, uh, as I mentioned, we can have an 18-year fund life, um, and they're okay with that. You know, they're, they're, it be, could be illiquid for quite a while. Then that's um, what gives us the ability to last through something like commercial development of fusion power. Um, we definitely work closely with the public sector and with um, at the right stages with corporations who are, who are doing uh, corporate uh, development and corporate investment. So we, we, it's not a quick VC, go big or go home type of thinking in, in most of these companies. Um, and our LP's expectations with regard to ROI are venture scale. You know, so there no, there's no concessionary, um, uh, uh, we're not a social impact fund. We're definitely shooting for, that's why we have to believe that these could become enormous businesses at global scale and, and that a very small ownership of the first company to succeed at commercial fusion power could be quite valuable. And, uh, you know, in compared to the, us when we wrote the first check when literally it was four employees and it's now coming up on 200 employees. They just raised a $1.8 billion venture round, biggest venture round in Boston history. Um, but we wrote a check for a few hundred thousand dollars and gave them four desks in our space uh, when they were getting started. Um, Pre-investment stage to offer market advice to the team. That's from Gregory. Um, R&D doing next level stuff. We really aren't set up for that. Um, it's, it's a really, we struggle with, with how to fix that particular gap. Um, sort of true R&D outside of a university, we, we haven't been able to figure out how to fit into that, uh, into, into that space. Um, and Jill asks, any of our current startups focused on CRISPR? Not at the moment, we've met with a few, but not, none of the ones we've currently invested in are doing CRISPR. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a few that are doing um, cell therapy kind of manufacturing uh, technology, but not specifically CRISPR. And Alejandro, thank you for this one. What metrics does the engine focus to evaluate performance as a venture firm? It's the, the difficult, there's some traditional financial metrics, but they're hard to evaluate when the fund is young. It hasn't had enough time for, for any exits, for instance. So, so the, the multiple of return, the, the, the dollars that have been distributed, the, the total value on paper, all of, yeah, all of those um, will be important long-term, but five years is not enough time even the first year is on, the first fund is only four years old and, and out of an 18 year fund. So it's hard to use those as measures. We look at, how, are the companies doing well? Are, are they, is the technology maturing? Are they, do they, are they getting customer interest? Are they able to hire amazing people? Do they, are they attracting the kind of resources and capital that they need? Are the companies doing well? Um, 
and we, we definitely focus on are the companies able to attract high quality follow on capital? Um, that's, you know, if, if other smart kind of uh, um, ROI driven investors s see these companies as a good opportunity, then that's, that's, that's just, it's a positive signal. It's hard to measure uh, in, in a kind of a, a quantitative way. Um, but Alejandro, thank you for that question. You know, let's see, how did you discover these destructive technologies and how do you define it as tough tech? Um, and then what percentage of inventors of these tough tech want to start their own business? And would we try and convince inventors to start a business now if they thought it might not have a real impact until 20 years from now? Yeah, those, those are really good. I think those are really nice, subtle questions. Um, we, we definitely discover these technologies and teams, remember our focus on, on people, um, a lot of it is inbound. You know, we try to tell the story of, of who we are, what we do, and, and um, what we're trying to look for. And a lot of people knock on our door. Um, we also you know, have a sort of methodical way to, to reach out to principal investigators at MIT and other universities and try to understand what the research interests are, what the, the, the interests of, of perhaps of the, of the PhD students and postdocs might be of carrying their, tech, their uh, technology forward as a company. Um, the percentage there, unfortunately we do run into a fairly often, I don't know if I could put a percentage on, on it, but it might even be more than two thirds uh, of research breakthroughs that are not, going to be carried out as an, in an entrepreneurial fashion. It doesn't mean that they won't be commercialized perhaps by licensing out obviously to, to existing corporations. Um, but the, as you can imagine, the, 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 the academic incentives around research, even at an applied institution like uh, MIT, um, kind of are what they are and aren't always, um, you know, advancing knowledge and, 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 um, and moving forward in an academic career and, you know, and publishing and advancing science. It may not be directly tied towards, let's use this breakthrough to solve a problem. So that's, we don't know how to change that. We've tried a couple of times to say, oh, let's build a team around this technology and, and it, it's not, some, it's not who we are as a, as a team. Uh, some venture firms are like that. Um, um, we have, we, we're not structured that way, but that's a really good question. And lastly, would I, would, would I personally try to convince someone to stick with something for 20 years? Oh, see, absolutely. If you can figure out a way, you, you have to, um, as a commercial endeavor outside of, of a research setting, of course, you have to have a line of sight to how you're going to get the support you need. And it's, it's, it's a truism in, in entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial endeavors that you don't need anybody's permission, but you will need their support. So what are the sequence, you know, the rungs and the ladder where you can raise the capital, have access to the talent, you know, get people on your side. You have to, if it's going to be 20 years before it has a true impact, there, there may be ways that you can do it, um, but you have to kind of link those, th those steps. Um, maybe in some of the examples of the companies that I'll now move into, I can um, um, uh, point out some that we got involved with where they'd been up and running for a while before we got involved and it may still take another, uh, it may take 20 years end to end. Um, does a, another question coming in, um, does a company have to be Boston based? We, um, for the time being, we have a very strong Boston focus. That's partly because our, our network of relationships is deepest here. Uh, it's a rich enough region that there's, there's plenty to do at our scale for now. Um, out of 37 companies, four of them are outside um, the Boston area, two in Houston uh, and two in the Bay Area. Um, um, and obviously our infrastructure, like the 200,000 square feet at 750 Main Street, our infrastructure is, is geographically situated. And we think 
the the capital, the funding, and and the infrastructure kind of support each other. So that's that's another reason. Um, okay, Simon, this is an interesting question um, from Simon. So if if we look at each each portfolio company as a research project instead of a commercial project. Um, is is the is the scientific research or the you know the development accelerated by our model? Um, or could it have been accelerated through at the same speed within a university? Um, I think this that that relates back to where the academic goals and the commercial goals diverge at some point. Um, when I get to via separations, a second company, I'll, I'll explain it and what I mean by that one. Um, and then John asked only MIT companies and the answer is no, about two thirds of them uh, have MIT roots, but uh, a bunch of them out of Harvard, a bunch, uh, a couple out of Tufts, uh, some out of Rice University, uh, uh, Northwestern, uh, some out of industry. Um, um, and then Stephanie, um, what suggestions do, would you have for student startups to prepare for applying? Um, that that is a really good good question. We um, I would encourage if they're MIT teams, um, there are obviously an enormous number of um, resources, whether it's uh, for for innovation and entrepreneurial uh, learning, uh, whether it's the venture mentoring service and um, the i -Corps program, whether it's the trust center and, and their accelerator programs, there are a lot of great project based classes where, where you kind of learn some of the tools for developing a plan and, and communicating how you're going to make progress and, and how you, you're going to take something new to market. So definitely trying to get some of that under your belt as students um, will, will, will be important. Um, and then um, from anonymous, do we help individuals with IP or IDs help find teammates? That's a hard one for us to do in, in, a, in, a, in a concrete way. Um, we do try to pull people together so they get to know each other. We have a, a five day over five weeks program we call Blueprint, which is on our website, which is for um, PhD students, postdocs, PIs, um, to kind of flesh out some of the scaffolding around an entrepreneurial plan. And, and we run it as a team session. So we've made up 40 or 50 people in each group. And that's that's a way to get to know people who are like-minded and, and expand your personal network. But we don't really have a way to match make in a concrete way for, for, for a solo founder to find uh, new team members. Um, um, and then questions about typical investment dollars and ownership amounts. That's a, there, there's, we don't have a standard standard uh, deal, if you will. We tend to try to say, hey, it would probably be easy, best for our model overall if, if we had 10, 15, 20% equity ownership at the, at the beginning. Um, we'll continue to invest for a few rounds after as we get diluted. Um, but usually that's that's in the range. Um, what do we value most in working with the TLO? It, it's an incredibly um, technically experienced set of people and very, um, I don't know what the right word is, very diligent and conscientious about making sure that MIT's IP will actually get put to good use, um, which is very aligned with what we're trying to do. I mean, we're trying to, to help the, the, the founding teams reach commercial success and scale, which ties back into yeah, the IP was was put into good hands. Um, but but that uh, that's something that, that I um, it's it's you know maybe over coffee or a beer that we could talk about how do we find the different TLOs different from each other um, um, at, at different universities. Uh, they are very different. Uh, um, climate, fashion industry, um, 
we've looked at some textile um, related um, companies. We haven't made any investments yet. I think it is, it's a really good, good um, whether it's fat, you know, clothing, fabric, or you know, Lowell, and the boot mill, and and uh, uh, or whether it's you know even um, the little canal um, behind the Galleria Mall was dug um, by wealthy landowners to to make waterfront land along that canal more valuable um, because in, back in that day they were that's there's a building a co-working space called the American Twine Building and. Next to Second Street, uh, you know, they were making rope. Lever Brothers was making soap along that little canal. You know, so raw materials were coming up from the south and being shipped, and finished goods were being shipped down. So Cambridge has been a manufacturing and and engineering uh, uh, hotbed for forever, uh, not forever, but for a long time. And um, unfortunately, the, those landowners lo lost their fortunes many of them because of the war of 1812, where there's a naval blockade along the coast and then it sort of dried up. Uh, it was their, their version of a pandemic uh, was this geopolitical uh, strife. Um, anyway, let me um, jump ahead for a second. And uh, when we open our Miami office, probably not at any time soon, but maybe someday. Okay, let me, this section will be, um, a little bit of quick storytelling about some of the companies to try to ground in concrete terms when we get involved, how that works, and what the happens with the companies. I, I cherry pick; these are all um, companies with some MIT uh, affiliation. Uh, Biobot is famous for doing sewage wastewater testing um, and for public health uh, understanding. And they, they're, uh, they are now doing an enormous um, sort of a COVID early watch, if you will. So if you go to Bo in Boston, they test at Deer Island every three days uh, and measure the, the virus, viral load in sewage wastewater that, that covers, I think, a couple of million people. If you look at the charts, there are they're, they're maybe a roughly five day early warning signal for, for the spread of a virus among the population. So you think of wastewater as, um, it's you're collecting um, medical specimens um, that nobody can opt out of. Well, I mean, it's hard to opt out of it. Um, and go look at the charts on the MWRA site. If you if you Google MWRA COVID, um, and the last week will explain to you why. I, um, one of our team members has kids in Cambridge schools, and they were like, "Yeah, they did pool testing of 3,500 students, ten at a time." 40% of the pools came back with a positive test. And you look at the curves of, of the viral loads over the last two samples. Um, um, they met at MIT. The re, it's not MIT research. Um, they, they raised a seed, fund, seed money. They went out to California, took part in Y Combinator. They raised uh, seed funding. Um, we wrote them a check. They'd, they'd already gotten up and running and, and had um, early customers around op opioid um, evaluation at a neighborhood level. Um, we wrote them a check literally when COVID hit and they realized they could do city scale testing. Um, they also are doing campus scale testing and individual building scale testing um, uh, at a, on a, a commercial side now. Um, literally when COVID hit, they went from four customers to 400 customers in four weeks. So watching them grow and scale and figure out as two recently, you know, recent doctorates, um, how to create an operating team to keep up with that pace of growth. To us, that was kind of how we helped them. So, so yeah, we wrote them a check. They were working, they are working in our, in our Cambridge facility. But one of our operating partners kind of joined the team for four weeks to kind of help them with setting up hiring plans and operations, swim lane, uh, business process uh, work. So that, that's kind of an example of not research based, but they met at MIT. They, they really wanted to have a positive impact on the world. And, and how do we work with them as they, as they grew quickly? Um, OK, here's uh, this is another typical pattern, one of our very first investments four years ago, uh, Shreya Deve in the center, uh, Brent Keller on the right, we're working in Professor Jeff Grossman's lab, 
And, and they, this is the example where the academic work kind of reached a certain point, but then the commercialization would, would be, not have been appropriate or relevant in the lab. Um, so we met them, they'd invented and been characterizing this uh, graphene oxide membrane with very controllable um, separate scale of separation. It's not really pores because it's kind of this weird linkage. It's these stack layers that link and you can control the, the length of the linking. As I understand it, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a scientist. I, I'm, I went to MIT as undergrad, dropped out and had a career in software. Um, but this team, we met them, they were casting and characterizing samples about the size of a silver dollar. They had this mission and concept that, hey, if you, if you a lot of industrial processes use our thermal separation, evaporation, distillation. If you could flip them, because this membrane uh, uh, material, uh, because of the pore size and because it was physically more robust, um, high pH um, cleaning um, uh, materials, uh, if you could flip thermal separation to filtration, you could save a lot of energy and that would be good for climate. So it, what they had to do would, would not, was not an academic exercise. They had to go figure out well, what's our first market. Would it be dairy? Would it be pulp and paper? You know, would it be petrochemical? Um, they said, okay, great. What did, how does that industry work and how do they buy? And, and okay, great. Looks like we can do something that has commercial value. Now, can we actually manufacture? You know, so they had to go from casting these little, little bits to roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing of, I forget, it's like a meter wide by 100 meters long, and it's wrapped up in a spiral cartridge. And so it's sort of it's it's a, a filtration cartridge, um, and then they had to learn how to talk to uh, pulp and paper mill owners who say, "You've got these giant evaporation columns. Um, your throughput of of your mill, which is a billion dollar capex, is is throttled by." The, the size of your of your holding pond for the liquid waste that comes out that you then evaporate. We think that we can use filtration in a very you know uh, low footprint way to to take water out of your pond and separate the waste. Um, and then they had to learn how to get a joint development agreement to do a pilot project to build these skids in containers, put them, take them down to a plant in Georgia, run them for a few months to gather to they gather the data and the proof, turn that into a commercial agreement. You know, are they going to license the process? Are they going to sell the equipment? Are they going to? We'll just release it. You know, we're responsible for replacing the membrane. So. Two, post, two PhDs, postdocs, Shreya went through MIT for 13 years, undergrad, a couple of masters, PhD. Uh, if you talk to her now as CEO, she she's, she's a business person. So, so this, is, this is, and they just raised, you know, I think 38. They've continued to gain the support they need to grow as a, as a company. Um, Turning back the clock, very recent investment, much like Shreya and um, Brent, two founders, one you know, full-time Emmanuel, uh, part-time Leslie. Um, they uh, came out of MIT. Um, their insight was that a diesel engine block, which for the moment is mass produced, very low cost. Within the cylinders, you get the pressure and temperature regimes that would be useful for different types of chemical synthesis. Uh, but it's a very small modular in system that could be uh, deployed in a decentralized way. So it, it's sort of an innovation in chemical manufacturing. Um, and their, their first uh, project will be to build small systems that can capture flare gas which is just wasted into the atmosphere and, and, and terrible for, for climate and economically uh, lost value. It could be fed into their system with, with a, a two-step process to create uh, liquid methanol on the other side that could then be trucked off and just sold into the methanol supply chain. So good for the climate, captures wasted economic value and form factor compatible with these oil fields with, with lots of independent uh, wells that are flaring uh, uh, natural gas. 
um, after methanol synthesis, their plan is to work on ammonia synthesis, which obviously has its, uh, its own really interesting positive uh, effects on the world. Uh, another recent team, um, osmosis. This is much like via separations, but for separation of gas. So they, in their academic work, developed a new membrane, uh, which could be used in gas separation to reduce costs. Um, they, this is the kind of thing which may be a 20 year project to get to an enormous global impact. So they, they have to start with a few different um, steps along the way. Their, their first idea is um, we got two potentially very easy to access markets. One is removing um, uh, sulfur compounds from natural gas, kind of what they call sweetening. Um, that's it could be a good business. It's still extractive and it's not, it's not really kind of, we had to get the engine, we had to say, okay, well, what else? Because that's by itself is not, you know, that may not fit our, make the world a better place. Um, Long-term, there's lots of separations that, that would be cheaper and, and more efficient. Um, we, the other thing they're looking at is it could be a very economical way to concentrate oxygen from the atmosphere. And there's a, a way to use um, concentrated oxygen in a, um, a furnace um, to increase fuel efficiency dramatically. And, and that, that has positive uh, impacts by decreasing the use of fossil fuel. Um, so that's probably one of their first markets as well. Um, here's one that, that actually, the, the earlier question is, is venture really the right way to get off the ground with, with some of these, these R&D companies? And Boston Metal um, uh, came out of work from MIT. They're working on, working towards green steel. Um, steel production is, is a, a big contributor to, to carbon footprint these days. Um, it uses electricity um, to smelt oxide, you know, iron ore into the metal, um, rather than having to use these um, coal fed um, steel mill processes that have been around for a hundred and you know, 140 years, maybe was it customer process. Um, the um, company, when we met them, they had been running for more than six years on government grants. And they were, they had been demonstrating the process um, at, you know, I think they have smelted maybe a thousand kilograms of metal in different types of forms uh, under these grants. Um, so by the time we met them, they were six years in. I they probably are another fifteen years from having kind of their vision of um, of uh, green steel, you know, kind of really converting the industry. Um, so this relates to: Would you recommend to somebody that they they head off on a twenty year mission? And the answer is sure. If you can if you can figure out how to stage it so that you can get all the way to 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 your 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 end outcome. Um, Kaido Pan. Okay, this is a, a, the CRISPR question. Um, Colin Bui on the left, uh, tenured Mekki professor, his postdoc, Paulo Garcia on the right, came out of uh, Mekki at MIT. And they had a, were working on a um, new method for introducing genetic material into living cells. So it's, key, it's a key step in, uh, in a lot of these um, emerging cell therapies uh, like CAR-T. The, the, the current methods of electroporation um, are not very gentle. You know, they're, they're not, not highly efficient, and, but they also reduce the number of living cells. And so that's why it takes, I forget exactly what, but 21 days for you take blood cells from a patient you run them through this genetic modification process. 21 days later, you, you have enough cells to infuse back into the patient. This Kytopen has demonstrated uh, and is now working on, on partnering. Um, a, their process is five orders of magnitude faster. Um, and it's, it takes, the cells are flowing through an electric field. And, and the fact that they're moving quickly through the field and that you can vary the, the, the electric field as they travel past um, 
is much more gentle in the cell, but opens up the same pores in the cell wall so the, the new genetic material can be introduced uh, and works across all different types of cell types. So it's, and it will be, it will work with a single pipette tip during kind of the discovery phase or just in a machine that's kind of cartridge to cartridge uh, at high speed for the for the uh, manufacturing stage, if you, if you can imagine a finish therapy. Um, that's an example of one that would have been hard for them to raise money from a traditional life sciences company because they're, they're really working on a platform. Um, uh, but it made sense for us. We really like what they're trying to accomplish. We, we, we were impressed by their um, uh, fortitude, if you will, in, in what they were, they were gonna try to do. Um, um, Form Energy, I think they may have been the first company we invested in. Yet Ming, Professor Yet Ming Chang, second from the left, um, repeat entrepreneur. He came to visit our CEO when we launched the engine, Katie Ray, and, and uh, said, hey, I, I'll be back in a couple months. I'm working on something. I, I want to support the engine, and I, I would love for you to consider being our first investor, um, uh, which was very generous of him because uh, uh, Yet Ming has done so many companies that, that he, 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 it would have been easy for him to raise money from all sorts of uh, sources. Um, the company is now working on very large scale grid connected um, batteries, um, which their goal is to have hundreds of hours of storage um, so that you can use intermittent renewables you know the wind is not always blowing the sun is not always shining um, but if you could if you could um, have very long-term storage you could use renewable resources as a substitute for um, base load generation um, they made a ton of progress uh, they've settled in on their on their their final chemistry um, they have a, a, a joint development agreement for their first plant uh, that they'll build out in the Midwest. Um, and they're, I think they're up to a couple hundred employees by now. Um, I see the two founders. Uh, this is one where the founders met as lab mates, a PhD student, Chris Baker on the right, and postdoc, uh, uh, Ibi Zhao on, in the middle, met in Josh Tenenbaum's group. Um, and they are, building a software system for self-driving trucks, tractor trailers. It's not really directly based on the research they were doing, but it's, it's the principles that they learned um, led them to believe they could solve autonomous driving in a di very different way. Um, they started by building on the highway autonomous trucks and they had permission from Texas to, to they were pulling full loads from Dallas to Houston and back. Um, with the safety driver. Um, um, then they, they pivoted to um, systems that work inside, um, imagine outside of a, a warehouse or distribution center. We have lots of trailers arriving and put in waiting areas and then you pull to loading docks and back to waiting areas, pull to loading docks, back to waiting areas. Um, where it's private property, is one insured, you know, it's, you're insured by one firm. Um, there's a huge driver shortage. They, they, um, they're they working in Long Beach with Maersk um, and Maersk, they said we have 100% turnover, annual turnover in drivers. Um, they um, are moving from pilot to commercial deployment in that location, starting to take over more and more beach shift. Um, and then they're, they're starting to implement with another second customer and with more Maersk locations. So they, we met them years ago, even before the engine, and um, they, they've steadily moved uh, in, into a, a, a production environment. Uh, so we do invest in software companies sometimes, not, not just physical um, uh, physical projects. Quays is out of the, the MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center. Um, uh, I, I, when friends ask me what do, what kind of companies do you work with? I often use this one because it's like, okay, you'll, you, you, this is hard to believe, but these guys are gonna use microwave energy to melt through solid rock deep into the earth's crust to get superheated uh, geothermal energy out. Uh, you can put it anywhere. You can you put it in the middle of Mexico city. It doesn't matter. You know, so it's, it's, if they get it to work, it could be a, a, um, 
um, a, a really nice new power source. Um, and the, the science behind it apparently is the deep drilling is, is hard. So this new energy directed drilling is, 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 is a potential important uh, way to get it done. Um, and at depth, it's so hot that you can recover a lot more uh, energy um, in, from the well. Uh, this is a, a, the reason this company is in Houston is because they, the energy, you, know, you talk about electrification and an energy transition. It, it's really also an industry transition. So they, one of their big partners is a company called Neighbors, which is the, I think they're the second biggest drilling uh, company in the US. So firms that know, you know, have built up the expertise over, over the last hundred plus years to drill um, still want to be drilling for energy. And this, this is essentially the same thing. You're just not bringing it out in the form of chemical, you're bringing it out in, in thermal. So, so a lot of what Quaze is working on is how do we convince the existing players in the energy industry? And this, this is also an example where venture may not be appropriate to take this company from start to finish. Um, the science was pretty raw when we met them and we was like, we can help you in the early days, um, but you're gonna need very different kind of help. Um, uh, and so getting, getting support from industry like, like neighbors who's an investor and, and partner um, is, is a path for, for the commercialization of some of these companies. Thank you for that earlier question. Uh, Rise Robotics, I got a couple more here, I think. Uh, Rise Robotics is um, uh, 10 years old. We met them 10 years ago when we were running an accelerator program in Boston called um, Techstars. Um, they are a set of four um, MIT undergrads who wanted to start uh, a company and they have invented Blake Sessions, who's the CTO, um, is a, I don't know if MIT folks you know the, the Louis de Flores Award for mechanical engineering. He, he was a winner of that when he was a student. Um, uh, I, I bonded, I, I, he's, he's so good at what he does as an engineer and an inventor that, that it was hard for me to kind of make him believe that that I could be helpful or, or knew anything that could be helpful to him. Um, but then I, I said, oh, you won the Luis de Flores Award. My, my professor, Woody Flowers, ended my, my device uh, without telling me and I got second place one year. So, so I thought I would be an, an Emmy at MIT um, if I had finished. So Blake, after that, he's, he kind of uh, warmed up. Um, these guys have a... Um, they're, they're just about to enter the market with uh, their first application of a linear actuator that's a substitute for, for hydraulics. So hydraulic um, power delivery is very inefficient and has a whole bunch of problems with maintenance and, and um, uh, leaking hydraulic fluid into waterways from ship uh, ports or into um, agricultural areas from, from farm heavy equipment from farms. Um, and it, this cylinder is not only more efficient, it's a belt and capstan driven patented, um, really interesting. So it's motor driven with belts and capstans can be as high power as hydraulics. They, their first um, partnership is for lift gates on the back of box trucks um, and a huge advantage of this technology over hydraulics is that it's regenerative. So when it's dropping a weight, it's actually generating electric power. Um, and the um, those cylinders have a, a I think forty five hundred pound lifting capability. They're putting together one now that has a, a fifty thousand pound lifting capability. So they're, they're able to scale the technology and, and their, their goal is to, is to replace hydraulics in heavy equipment, thereby allowing heavy equipment to be uh, electrified. So imagine um, stacking containers at, at the port of Long Beach with an electric top loader. Um, and they're, they're 
it's not research out of MIT. There are people that met at MIT, trained at MIT, um, but uh, we, we, um, we've known them for 10 years and finally invested in them last year. Sublime, another Yetming Chang company, Leah Ellis, the CEO. Um, this is a, a, a clean cement um, using um, electricity uh, to uh, turn limestone into lime uh, at room temperature. So doing away with, with the need for these fossil fuel driven furnaces uh, that, that are used in cement uh, production. And, and cement is one of the, 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 the most carbon dirty um, volume, you know, uh, contributors to carbon footprint uh, today. Um, they're very early stage, very, very early stage. Um, Sync computing out of Lincoln Labs. Um, we, we consider them MIT Lincoln Labs. We have a really nice relationship with them. A lot of our companies actually do research, pay Lincoln Labs uh, to do uh, work for them. Uh, and um, whether it's fabricating wafers. Uh, um, and then we, occasionally we can, we can pull some uh, inventions out of uh, Lincoln and, and license them out with the team to, to make it a company. They, they've, sh they've shifted dramatically. Originally they were an analog computing hardware company that would use, had a new technique for, um, a new technique for, for solving optimization problems. Um, they wrote a digital emulation of their analog circuit and realized that that was essentially a software only algorithm, which is dramatically better than any other approach that had been tried. They're just about to launch um, an accelerator, an optimization service for tuning cloud applications. It's if you have a very big distributed application with resources like compute resources, memory, network links, um, you know, storage network links, optimizing the, the, the combination of those resources um, is a very complex uh, problem. And in most data engineering teams, it, some of their customers are, are spending a million dollars a month on um, cloud bills to run these data processing workflows. And the engineering teams are spending a huge amount of their time trying to tune uh, and, and speed up or save money in, in these very complex uh, distributed applications. Their customers don't mind spend a million dollars a month on the bill, but they want their engineers working on something that actually relates to the business and, and is growing the business uh, rather than just tuning the system. Um, so the sync team has a mathematical approach um, to optimizing and they, they've shown results with some of their customers that they can either dramatically speed up or reduce by as much as 80% the, uh, the cost uh, of, of, uh, of, of the application processing, if you will. Another example, a routing company came out of C-Sale. Uh, Alex Waller in the top right was working on his PhD. He actually did drop out, which is not our goal, um, but he um, had done research on optimizing the sharing of vehicles. So how do you do ride sharing without, and, and understand how you, uh, damaging the, the rider's experience. If everybody takes their own taxi, it picks me up, it drops me off. If we're sharing, someone has to wait a little longer to be picked up. Someone has to wait a little longer to be dropped off. So his algorithm and, and research with um, uh, Daniela Roos was solving, coming up a new approach to handling that problem. He decided to drop out, start a company around it. He got an advisor, uh, James Cox, who had been at Uber, had launched uh, Uber Pool, had launched Uber in Australia as a great advisor. James decided to come join the company. Alex decided, hey, you're a better CEO than me. You know, I'll, be, I'll switch out to CTO you, if, if you want to be CEO. Um, they're live in, I think, five countries, five locations right now. Uh, uh, Bainbridge Island in Was Washington State. Um, the country of Andorra has, is running 30, has run 30,000 riders, uh, kind of now has uh, 
a nationwide call of shuttle van service uh, using their software. Um, they've run uh, uh, live, they're running live projects in Scotland. Um, so we do invest in some software driven companies, um, but this was built on a fundamental kind of breakthrough algorithm. Um, neither Uber nor Lyft have been able to uh, effectively solve the, 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 the sharing problem. Um, and that, that we know well because the CEO had worked at Uber and the head of product design had worked at Uber as well. Um, and last, the big company of the moment, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, um, out of MIT, unusual MIT and commercial, I think it's a one-off uh, relationship. The, the company has many, many employees and has a relationship with the Plasma Science Fusion Center to have many, many MIT employees working on research that directly relates to what the company is doing. Um, the, they um, demonstrated the, the world's most powerful high temperature superconducting magnet um, recently, which was, they had said, we need to raise a bunch of money. If we can make the, our, our model show, if we can make the magnets this strong, then the rest of it is just engineering uh, to build a tokamak um, that uh, will act as a heat source for a commercial power station. Um, the um, company, once they demonstrated that they could build the magnet and it produced the field strength they needed, 20 Tesla, the um, uh, access to capital became much easier. There are all these people waiting on the wings. Uh, and again, you, you asked earlier, one, one asked was, is venture the right way to build these companies? Um, you know, obviously there's several billion dollars of research that this single company is, is standing on top of, is, is you know, the, the pure science over the years. Um, what they need to do, if they can build 10,000 of these tokamaks around the world, that would cover all of today's electricity needs. Um, they're just, you know, they, the way Bob, the CEO described it, they are just machines. You know, Boeing has built 10,000 737s. Um, they're just machines. Um, so they have to prove that it, it works. So they built the magnet, they're building, they, they've, uh, they're poured concrete and they're building a, a test site out in Devon's Mass for their first demonstration reactor, which is about three years away is their target. If the demonstration reactor is not gonna generate electricity, but, but if they can run it and uh, talk back in a kind of sustainable way, then it'll, it'll take them um, maybe another, I think it's 10 or 12 years to build their, their first production um, uh, power generating um, tokamak. So this again is one of these ones where when they prove the magnet worked, they were gonna try to raise between 500 million and, and a billion dollars for their next step to build this test reactor. They, they wound up raising $1.8 billion. And, and it's uh, only because it's a, it could become a big enough business. You see, see an Apple become a $3 trillion valuation company as, as, a, as a public company. And somewhere in here, is, is, is there a trillion dollar company? Um, you can plausibly do the arithmetic and, and make that case. Um, Okay, I took longer than I expected, but I hope that was interesting. I'm happy to, to take more questions. Uh, and uh, that's kind of how the engine, I hope that got some engine. Uh, how do we actually help these companies um, out, out in front of you? And some sense of what kind of companies we're looking for. So, okay, I have another question here. The engine, by definition would include ML software collaboration. Um, we have looked at a few. Um, we are working in, an, um, we, we started a, a first program called Interval where we took for at the moment one team in out of uh, CSAIL, a company called Themis, T-H-E-M-I-S. Um, we, we, we basically put a call out and said, look, if there's advanced computing research, preferably peer review published um, that you want to commercialize, but you haven't had time to think 
work on their business plan. So, so it's maybe not investable by a traditional VC. We'll write a small check. We'll help you figure out how to get to the next rung on the ladder. Um, and this team, it's an ML, uh, uh, it's research around ML, removing bias from data sets, measuring, and then removing bias from data sets and, and during training. Um, their, their business value is if you train against what you've done in the past, how you've given out loans, how you've hired people based on their resume, you maybe have systemic bias in your models, which will prevent you from identifying great candidates from underrepresented categories based on their resume or identifying um, great um, companies or people to, to grant loans to based on their, their, their history. Um, so you may be missing something because of the bias carried forward. And, and the other research they published was based on um, clinical trials where rare data of success in the training data made the, the traditionally trained models less, um, less predictive against which patients would be helped. And so they uh, had ways to, to identify that scarcity, correct for it, both in the data and in the training uh, step. So they're, they're building a service that could be used as part of a data uh, ML pipeline um, to control and remove, to measure and remove uh, bias. So that fits in an ML uh, world. We, we wouldn't invest in just an application of ML you know, hey, we can use, we've got software that we've trained to read dental x-rays, um, but some type of advance, kind of breakthrough advance, we would. Other question. Do we ever work with external consultants? Are you okay being reached out for, for a conversation about some of the topics? Yes, we, we do work with some external consultants. We have um, relationships with some specialized firms. Um, uh, a firm that we work with helps companies with um, grant writing, for instance. Um, we have um, some contract research organizations, some engineering consultancies that we've gotten to know uh, and, and trust that, that we kind of recommend to our companies. Um, less often the engine itself working with, with consultants, um, but, and uh, are we open to people reaching out to us? Yes, uh, I think my email is on the website, read at engine.xyz. Um, uh, but my name is different enough that it's easy to Google, figure out. Um, oh, and anonymous, the name of the ML company, the, 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 the company is called Themis, T-H-E-M-I-S, and they're the debiasing uh, company. other questions about the companies or, oh, okay, interesting. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so Craig asked another one, uh, investments in tamping down zoonotic diseases. How reaction, do, do, yeah, uh, especially being near Kendall Square and biotechs. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, we have talked to, some companies that might cross over with traditional biotech life sciences investment across Kendall. Um, we are talking to some related to crop health. Um, uh, we haven't invested in any in, in those areas. We talked to some that were working on um, novel approaches to antibiotic resistance. Um, so, yeah, um, 
we one of our our general partners, Anne DeWitt, has a life sciences background. So we do look at things that we and she does look at things across ranges. I mean, like all investors, we have our biases um, uh, for or against certain areas that I, I can't speak for her about kind of how she feels about that that sector area. Um, we we take a lot of lot of meetings. Uh, it may not be one of the partners at first. Um, we have um, three general partners to make investment decisions, Katie Ray and the with myself. And um, we have three associates with different background, a PhD in, in microbiology, kind of PhD in, in um, energy techno-economic uh, work. Um, and then a mechanical engineer who worked in the industry for a number of years. And we have a, a director of research and analytics who has a life sciences background, my um, um, molecular biology background. Um, and so we have a pretty broad, and we have a, what we call a platform team that works on side by side, helping the teams for short duration, um, uh, everything from marketing to um, product planning. Um, um, I mentioned grant writing, sort of fundraising. Okay, here's another question. Um, oh, could we contact individuals from those companies to learn about their experience with the engine? Yes, of course. I, I, and I hope that they, they would all say good things, but I, I have no way to uh, understand that. But yeah, we often, when we're looking to make an investment into a new company, we often say, hey, go talk to the founders or people that we've worked with at other companies. They're the, they're the best way to understand what we do. Um, Another, okay, another question. Um, how can someone value a granted patent to assess if there's a basis to raise funding and build a company from it? Um, that is a question that is kind of outside my specialty area of strategic IP review. Um, we want we prefer that there is IP and, and we do try to understand both the protective as well as freedom to operate landscape for some of these companies. Um, um, they often go work with specialty IP strategy firms, um, um, separate from you know, patent lawyers, and, but, but really kind of more strategic thinking. Um, but it's not really my, on the investment way, and we don't really try to decide whether a company should be built around a patent. Um, here's another one. Any interest in companies addressing fintech innovation, inclu including financial inclusion? That is a hard one. Um, that would be a hard one for, I think, to fit into the engines. People often ask, what do we mean by tough tech? And, and it's purposely a, a, a broad term, meaning there's some fundamental science or engineering difficulty. Um, and tough meaning durable. Um, um, but financial inclusion, fintech innovation, we, we definitely would, we're not involved in any of the kind of blockchain, Web3, work um so we're probably not the best firm to come to for that type of uh that type of project um let's see if there's any others oh do we point board members for companies in the portfolio um we we do help them search for independent board members. Um, so the question here relates to, um, for instance, with Sloan Fellows, EMBAs, um, industry uh, experienced uh, specialists, um, be considered for those type of roles. And and, and the, the answer is yes. We don't have a system in place for, you know, looking for a catalog of which companies might next need independent directors and, and, and what backgrounds would they be looking for? Um, so it's a little bit ad hoc, but we do, 
we do help companies find independent board members, most often after a few other investors are involved. Um, early on, if we take a lot of board seats, but it'll be a partner from the engine. Um, and then once, if you're familiar with the, the, the way the early stages, it's often a founder control board. It might be two founders and, and one investor. And then as more investors get involved, it could still stay you know, two founders, two investors, one from each firm, and then one independent. So it, it often is once you start adding multiple investments, investors, not universally, I'm on a board that was three, it was one founder, one independent and myself. Um, they just raised a lot of money. So they're moving to a five person board. Um, but would, would a Sloan Fellow EMBA uh, with industry background be appropriate as an independent board? The answer would, would be, there, there's certain, I could certainly see situations where that would come up. Okay, uh, coming up on time. Um, these webinars are always kind of a one-way format, so I, I uh, hope this was a, a good use of your time. Um, for me, the, the more people know about what the engine really does, the better, and then being having people understand the companies around Boston and what they're doing and how you may be able to engage as someone who wants to work at the company, someone who, who has, a, has a service that would be helpful to the company or a customer, um, advisor, board member. Um, I, I love to get the story out. So um, with that, I think we're on time. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to attend.